Okay, we're continuing in 1 John chapter 5. My intention was this. I'll teach the first five verses as a block, and then I'll go to verses 6, and I think it's to about 11 or 12. I don't have my notes in front of me right now. You know, take the next the chapter in blocks, which is okay, and that's acceptable. But as I got began to get into it and look at it and try to understand what the Lord is saying to me. Let me say this about that word trying. By the way, God never tries. I'm the one who tries to understand him. Trying to understand where do you want me to go? What detail? And so you remember last week, we just did the first part of the first verse. Remember that? Whoever is Believes what, rather? What? Whoever believes what? That, come on, first part of the verse. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is what? Born of God. Or you could say born again. And we took a lot of time to talk about that word belief. If you weren't here last week and you did not listen, please go online. Because this is what we said. We are not members of the kingdom of God because we decided to ask Jesus to save us. That is not the reason. Everybody remember that? That's what some believe. If you don't ask first, you're not born again. Jesus has it the other way in John 10, 27. But you just have to go online. So remember last week we saw that John reminded the church that genuine faith begins with the bedrock of our genuine faith believes what? That this man is the son of God and the son of man who satisfactorily, the satisfaction of God completely and absolutely and forever has atoned for all our sin for all time. Amen? Amen. That's what John begins with in chapter 5, and he's mentioned this several times. And so, in the verses this morning, the second half of the first verse, 1b into verse 2. John, once again, and we see this, John is extremely repetitive. I mean, haven't we heard these words before? You've already said this. You taught this three weeks ago. We're ready to what? Move on. But you see, John knows something. And the reason John knows something is that the Holy Spirit tells him to know something. And he knows this. That when it comes especially to the essentials of our faith, we must understand them and know them very specifically and clearly. And not only must we know them, but we must have them repeated to us over and over again. Amen? Because we lose sight of them. And more basically, because we ain't doing what the detail, uh, the uh, specifics say. One preacher was preaching grace. And he told us, it was Danny Jones, years ago. I think he had done it 10, 12, I don't know how many times he'd. You're preaching, you're preaching. You know what? I'm going to do it until you understand it and get it. So why does John continue to repeat? Because the Lord says they need a constant reminder. Because of this fleshly body we live in, this body of sin, we are way too prone to move away and not obey the Lord. How many of you found that it's very easy just to drift away? Amen. It's very easy not to love someone who is obnoxious. Anybody raise your hand on that? Okay, everybody. So what does he emphasize again? He emphasizes that we are to love God and to love one another. This is a twin ob obedience. This is a twin issue. Loving God, loving one another, loving one another, loving God. They go together. Two sides of the same coin. And we must obey God's commands. This is how we know we're believers. 
And so in these three verses of chapter 5, sorry, in these two verses of chapter 5, John again sets forth the doctrinal, the moral, and the relational test for the genuineness of our faith. So if someone says to you, how do you know you're a believer? Do not say this. You can say it, but don't say it and then stop there. I received Jesus as my Savior. Fine. So, Phyllis, how do I know that was a genuine work of God? How do you know? Young people, how do you know that you're in the faith? How do you know you're saved? The Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 says, and he's writing to believers. He says, test yourself to see whether you are in the faith. This is Elton and Mara. Good morning, guys. Good to see y'all. You didn't think we'd remember, did you? And of course, everybody knows Nathan Loria. All right. Come on in, Stephen. So if someone says, how do you know you're saved? It's okay to share with them. I was in an evangelistic crusade. I was listening to a song, whatever it is. And I felt overwhelmed by the presence of God. And I was convicted that I was a sinner. And I received Jesus. I received him. I trusted him. Now, is that a viable testimony? Yes, it is. But how do you know that it was genuine? Because I felt it. That's not the proof. What is the proof? Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? The doctrinal proof. Do you love God and love one another within the context of his love. The relational proof. Do you find your heart loving the people of God? Maybe not perfectly, but you're beginning to experience something. And what is the moral proof? Do you find yourself increasingly obeying God's commands? If one of those three ain't there, I mean ain't there, you ain't saved. Because a three-legged table cannot stand on just two legs. It must have, what, all three collectively functioning in order to hold the table up, right? What's your name again? Jonathan. Say it again. Jonathan. Jonathan. I like that name, brother. How many of you know my grandson's name? Jonathan. Jonathan. Okay, good for you. You thought, oh, my word, he doesn't know somebody. Those are the tests. John has been repeating this. And it's like, okay, here we go again. I'm going to get the same information. And quite frankly, this is what I'm thinking when I'm looking at the uh, verses. What do I say about these that hasn't been said already? Especially by Nick and by Todd, who are out of town. What do I say about this? They've covered it pretty well. There's always more, but you know, what am I going to say? What more to say? And so I'm, I'm moving along, putting something together for the notes. And so by Friday, typically, I'm finished the notes. Typically, not always. And so I'm ready to send them in to, to Stephen Mackey and Abby Lemoyne, who put them together in the frame that you have. By the way, if you see Abby Lemoyne and Stephen Mackey, please thank them. This outline is not from me. I do not do outlines well. And I'm sitting out there Friday morning, about nine o'clock in the morning. And all of a sudden the Lord says, <clears throat> okay, now let's restructure the notes. And I'm saying, it's a little close. I'm not used to that close of a shave. Close shave. Oh, yeah, I understand. 
So what you see here is a restructuring. It's something that I think the Holy Spirit has given me for us. In relation to communicating these verses to us in a different way than perhaps what we have considered previously. So this morning, I want us to remind us of the biblical background for John's teaching that unites God's loving God, loving one another with our obedience. What is the biblical, or we could say the background that John is building upon that comes before John? What John is teaching here has been already taught, and John is reiterating what has already been taught. So let's look at this. First, the biblical background for John's teaching that joins God's love and our love for one another with our obedience to God's commands. So let's look at these verses. Second part of verse 1 into verse 2. Whoever loves the father loves the child born of him. Have we heard that before? Yes or no? Yeah, 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 many times. You just go back through John and look up the word love in each other and you'll see it all over the place. Verse 2, by this we know that we love the children of God. How do we know? When we observe God's commandments. So there are the two tests that are a part of and extensions of and proof of that we believe that Jesus is the Christ. We love one another as we love God. We love God as we love one another. And we keep his commands. There it is. So John's authority for joining our obedience with the love of God comes from whom? Comes from the Lord Jesus himself. So I want to go back and look at the background of these commands and then move forward. In Mark chapter 12, verse 28. You may not remember it because you may not know it immediately, but Jesus is being questioned. Remember the Pharisees and the lawyers and the scribes and the Sadducees were regularly trying to catch Jesus in some doctrinal error. You remember that? So they could prove what? Anton, what? He can't be the Messiah because he doesn't believe the word of God. They're trying to Undo, if you would, his assertion or at least what it looks like he's saying to them, I am the Messiah. So they're continually looking for loopholes, if you would. And so the lawyer comes up and he says, what's the greatest of all the commandments? What's the greatest? What's the greatest of all the commandments? So in the next verses, Jesus tells them. He begins with the Shema. Shema Yisrael. Adonai Elohanu. Adonai Chad. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God. The Lord is one. Where does Jesus get this? This is the great Shema, the great confession of the nation of Israel. This is the central, quintessential confession of Judaism. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, Yahweh, the Lord our God, the Lord is what? One. This is the great confession of monotheism. Where does he get that? Is it in your notes? It should be at least in your notes. You need to know this. Jesus is not just making up something. Every doctrinal teaching that Jesus spoke had already been spoken in the Old Testament. He tells us nothing new he gives us understanding and revelation of what was said that may seem new, and it is new to our understanding. But the core of it and the essence of it is not new. It's all in the Old Testament. Amen? Every bit of it. So where does he get the Shema? Deuteronomy what? 
chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Okay, and then that's all Jesus has to say. Love God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. Remember that? Come on in. All the way up. It's okay. Come on in. Everybody's already looking at you. I'm so glad to see you. How many of you know this young man? Who is this? Jude, Jude Loria. Hmm. So, so glad to see you. God is great. God is one. God is our God. The result of that and the meaning of that and the reality of that, if we believe it, is that we'll love him. You see how he puts it together. Does he stop there, though? What else does he say? And the second commandment is what? Come on, I can hear you. I can't hear you. What? The second commandment is an extension or like unto it. The second commandment is part of the first. It's not a tack on. It's part of the first. It is as essential as the first in demonstrating the reality that this God is our God. And so what's the second commandment? You shall love what? Your neighbor as yourself. Now, it's not a command to love your neighbor and to love yourself rather. It is just a statement that this is what you're going to do. If you love God, you're going to love one another with the same kind of love. Where is that taken from? It may be in your notes. Where is it? Someone scream it out. Leviticus 19, 18. That's the reference. Leviticus 19, 18. Now, by the way, all of us should know these two references. Then look at what he says, and he doesn't say this in Mark, but he says it in Matthew twenty two forty, 40, which is the same conversation. Then Jesus says that he said this. You shall love God, you shall love your neighbor. Then look what he says in chapter 22, verse 40. What does he say? On these what? The entire, two commandments rest what? The entire law and the prophets. He is saying this, that these two are so united that they comprise the law and the prophets. Now, we don't see that Jesus Christ is Lord there. He's there, but he's not there revealed yet until the incarnation. And then we'll see that the Lord, who is one, is a Trinitarian monotheism. He's one in his being, but three in his persons. And we don't see that until the incarnation. But that's there. It's there. Therefore, Jesus says that obeying God has to do with loving God and loving one another. Now, let's go look at verse 3. First of all, do you see the background? Do you understand the biblical background for the first two verses? Everybody see that? Okay. Verse 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. We know that. So what is John telling us? We keep his commandments, but his commandments are not what? A burden. Now, why is John telling us this? Why is John telling you, Haddon, that it's not a burden to obey God? Because too often, what is it? Huh, it's hard. It's inconvenient. Are these words that you never thought of in relation to your obedience? Now stop for a moment and think of just one person in your life that is an irritant to you. Can anybody think of one person at least? Hmm? Yeah, yeah. Think of that one person who's an irritant. <laughs> you irritate me. I don't like you. The way you act, what you say, your attitude. Stephen, you irritate me. 
Charles, you have anybody like that in your life? Ray? Rachel, you have anybody like that in your life? Don't look at your mama. Don't do that. I saw your eyes move to the left just a little bit. But you see, Pam didn't see that. I saw it. <laughs> and for goodness sakes, husbands, don't glance at your wives. They already know it. Anybody irritate you, Rosa? Yeah. Now, think of the person who irritates you. Teachers. <laughs> I used to be a school teacher. And believe it or not, I can irritate people. I know that's not known normally, but I can do that. Somebody said amen. <laughs> Somebody said amen back here. And I know who said it, Mike Ramirez. Obedience to God. Okay. I, when the Lord says, hey, don't get drunk. That's not a burden for me to obey because Gina and I don't drink any alcohol at all. So it's easy for me to obey that command. Don't get drunk. You know, oh, okay, that's easy. Man, that's not a burden. Don't tempt God. By standing in front of a moving truck. That's easy for me to obey. So the many of the moral laws that many of us would say, yeah, that's not a problem. It's easy. But Bridget, when it comes to something about how you two brothers, three brothers treat you. I've known that lady since she was like 14 years old. She is old. <laughs> I used to teach a family in Sunday school. I've been around a long time. And then you hear the word of the Lord say, love that person as I love you. I see you're sweating, Wendy. <laughs> you're sweating. <laughs> Is that a burden? Come on, come on. What's the reality? Is it a burden to love those who are really getting under your skin? Is it? Yes or no? Come on. Yes, it is. It's a burden in the natural, in the flesh. It is a burden. And what does it mean? What are we hearing from John in this verse 3? If I am being burdened or find it difficult or in any way, mm, to love a brother or a sister or to do Anything in relation to God's obedience. I find it difficult. At that moment, I realize I'm, I'm doing what, Phil? I'm not obeying God. Very easy. How do you know? Your guts. King James calls it the bowels of God because they felt that the emotions were in the gut. How many of you feel things when it's irritating or whatever? You feel it in your guts. Come on. It's just different. But when you're feeling and experiencing the goodness and the presence and the mercy and the love of God, do you feel it in your guts or higher up? Come on. Where? You see your guts. And when you feel anything in your guts, you know that that's not the Holy Spirit. You just know that. Let your feelings be a spiritual barometer to you. I can tell in a hair of a second whether something is of God, for the most part, through the way I what? Feel. So if my feeling toward another is in any way irritable, judgmental, Reject it, whatever. Obeying God at that moment is a real difficulty or burden. So let's answer these two questions in these verses. Why are God's commands not a burden to obey? And how do we know when our obedience is a burden to us? What makes God's Obedience, not a burden. 
Well, let's go back to the Old Testament and use two men as examples. And these two men are highlighted by the Lord Jesus. Highlighted by the Lord Jesus. David and his son, Solomon. So you remember in 1 Samuel 13, 14, you remember King Saul has been anointed king. Saul has been anointed king, but he disobeyed God. He didn't wait at Gilgal for the seven days as he should have. So he attacked the enemy. And the Lord says to Samuel, I've torn the nation away from him. He's not my man. He's not obedient. Go down to Bethlehem to the sons of Jesse. And I'm going to lead you to anoint him whom I have chosen to be king over my people. Do you see it? David had the gifting. But the reason he had the gifting, because he had the anointing first. The anointing of God is going to be manifested through the gift of the gifting. So Samuel goes down there, and you may remember, this brother comes up, and this brother, not him, not him, not him. And all these brothers are there. And then Samuel said, hey, is anybody else? And what does Jesse say? The youngest is where? Where is he? He's over there in the pasture doing what? Shepherding. Tending to the sheep. He's being a good shepherd. This is the one whom I will make rule over my people. Do you, did, did you just hear the connection? See the connections. When the Holy Spirit puts in there about David's a shepherd, he didn't put, let me how many, let's see how many words I can do to fill up a page. He's not writing a composition in the English class. Samuel explained to Saul, the Lord is looking for a man after his own heart and appointed him as leader after his own heart. How many times have you heard David was a man after God's own heart? We've heard that. So what does it mean to be a man after God's own heart? I've, I've seen a lot of sermons, and I'm okay with what it means is that David is going to do that. You know, he's going to be obedient, and he's going to, okay, fine. But there is a meaning that gathers into it all the other meanings. There is a meaning which is central to all the other meanings, and perhaps we already know it. A man whose heart was in agreement with God's desire. A man after God's own heart. A man whose heart, whose desire, whose disposition, whose inclination, whose way of life is morally in correspondence with God's will. So in 1 Samuel 16, 1, Lord sends Samuel to Bethlehem and he says, I'm sending you to Jesse for I've chosen one of the sons to be king. So David is a man after God's own heart. What does it have to do with being burdened? We're getting there. I'm just not fast. Years later, 1 Chronicles 22, 7 to 10, David explained what God meant when he called him a man after God's own heart. Here's the explanation. This is one of the places. What does it mean to be a man or a woman after God's own heart? David said to Solomon, you see, David's dying. My son, I had it in my heart. What? Is it in your notes? What does it say? I had it in my heart to do what? To build the house for the name of the Lord my God. What is it to be a person after God's own heart? That the central desire and purpose of your life Is to be involved with the building of the house of God. Everything else is submitted to that. And everything and anything else in my life must be judged by that one issue. 
Am I, is my life, is my purpose, is everything about me committed to one single purpose? Am I a person whose life means one thing for the building of God's house? But the word of the Lord came to me saying, you have shed too much blood and have waged great wars and you shall not build a house to my name because you've shed too much blood on the earth before me. Behold, a son will be born to me who shall be a man of rest. Look at that word. If it's in your notes, circle it. Rest. Where have you heard that? Who's a man of rest? Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come on. What does it say? Come unto me, all ye who are. What weary or burden and what heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Do you see what the Lord is showing us in this man, Solomon? You see the prefiguring here? He's going to be a man of rest. And I will give him rest from all of his enemies on every side. Jesus is at rest from all of his enemies. For his name shall be called Solomon. Shalom, peace, peace, and I will give peace and quiet to Israel in his days. Do you see the ramifications for us? He shall build a house for my name and he shall be my son and I will be his father and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. In 2 Chronicles 3, 1, then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. Where have we heard that word before? Moriah. And the Lord said to Abraham, take your son Isaac, your only son, the son whom you love, and take him to the land of Moriah and there sacrifice him. Where was Jesus crucified? On the same mountain, the hill, outside of Jerusalem, called Moriah. That's where the cross was. They say this Bible isn't consistent. <laughs> They're crazy. You see, although the work of building was long and arduous, physically difficult, Sweaty. Man, my back hurts today. I picked up so many stones and ugh. That's not the question. Was this task, this responsibility, a burden to Solomon and his people? Was it? It was a what? A great joy. Why? Because all that they were doing was to build this magnificent temple for the presence of Yahweh among his people. So in 2 Chronicles 7, 5 to 6. And further in that chapter, the great joy, the celebration. Why should our obedience not be a burden? Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 7, 24. Everyone who hears these words of mine. Did you just hear Romans 10? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ or the word of God. Do you see it? Everyone who hears these words of mine and what does them? Obedience will be like a wise man who did what? What's the result of obeying the word of God? Building the house of on the rock. Do you see the connection here? Are you with me this morning? Everyone who hears these words of mine, who, who is born again to the kingdom and receives Christ, believes that Jesus is the Christ, who begins to be imbued with a new heart. Remember Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27. A heart that the heart of God's love is now set in us. So that now I am able to re <clears throat> receive the love of God and to reciprocate, to return the love of God to him. And as I return it to him, I am giving that same love to others. 
And that is going to be my obedience to the Lord. Everyone who hears these words and obeys them, what are we doing when we are hearing and obeying God's word? What are we doing? We are being used by the Holy Spirit as his building blocks to build a spiritual house for the Lord, 1 Peter chapter 2. Do we get this? Are we seeing the connection this morning? I want to make sure we see the connection. And why is it a joy? Whose joy is it? Jesus says, my joy I give to you so that your joy may be what? <laughs> Full. So what does Hebrews 12 say? Verse 2. It's not in your notes. You just have to be careful. It says this, looking off to Jesus. Who for the, come on, I can't hear anybody. Somebody raise their voice. Raise your voice when you use this word joy. Say it loudly. Joy. For the joy. For the joy. For the joy. Whose joy, Rosa? God's own joy. Why is Jesus filled with joy? Because he, through the cross, through the obedience of faith, we see that in Philippians 8. Obedience, even to the death on the cross. His obedience resulted in God raising him from the dead. And Jesus ascends to the heaven, into the heaven. He is exalted as the Son of God, as to his humanity. He is exalted forever as a King of kings and Lord of lords in his humanity. And as a result of that, he gives authority to the Holy Spirit to come into the earth and gather his people. He begins to build the temple. The temple of God. And so we are his temple, we're told in 1 Corinthians 6. In some ways, Jesus was a lonely man of great suffering. The sole suffering of the Son of God is greater than all of the soul suffering of every one of his people who have ever lived. The soul suffering of this man. Yet that soul suffering was done and experienced with great joy. Why? Because he would be the Emmanuel, God with us, in whom and through whom the Father would dwell with his people forever. Remember Revelation 22. Was it a burden for Jesus to obey to the cross? No. So listen to the result that Jesus experience in Philippians 2.8, obedience even unto death. What was the result? What's verse 9 say? Wherefore also God has done what? Given him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Yeshua, Jesus, Every knee shall bow of things in the heavens, things on the earth, and things under the earth. And every tongue shall confess what? That Jesus Christ is Lord. Why? For the glory of God the Father. Why shouldn't our obedience be a burden to us? Because in that obedience, God is building a house in which his name, his person is being glorified forever. So the next time you run across that <laughs> person, you know what I mean, Nathan? You have him in your life. Hmm. And you begin to feel that stuff in your guts. 
Remember this. I'm not going to go with it. I have a choice. I will not let my feelings and emotions carry the day. I will look to Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now set down at the right hand of God. And I will allow and cooperate with him as he gives me his love to love that person, to be patient, kind, gentle, etc. As my soul will be flooded with the joy of the Lord, Nehemiah 8.10. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Ultimately, for what purpose? That God my Father may be what? glorified in my loving obedience. Next week, we'll continue with the last two verses.